from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. On my desk is a paperweight, a copse of glass flowers inside. Of the few last months, my father amassed a collection of paperweights. He knew he was going to disappear. Finally, my mother said, take a couple. I don't think I have the proper papers to wait. The other is a pewter frog. It was May, I was 19, writing a paper on Hamlet for a professor who'd hang himself. I remember the funeral director asking my sister and me if we wanted to see my father one last time. I thought for a moment it was a serious offer, but he was talking about a corpse, a corpse in makeup. But this year I will get it right. I will stare at a single branch for all of May. I will know what it's going through, at least on the fructifying surface. In May, he bought a yellow suit he wore just once. In May, I will listen to the bark whimper and split, the blossoms blink from sleep. I will haunt the town I've haunted for years, turning the corner of Sixth and Grant, seeing myself just ahead in that ratty jean jacket, sleeve ripped to fit over the cast. A few pains remain, become formalized, enacted in dance, but I'm careful not to catch myself. He might want to get me high in the middle of the day. I might have work to do. I might be going to the ash I planted over my dead cat years back behind the garden where Nancy lost the ring my father made from a quarter during the war. She will be sobbing, digging among the infant tomatoes. It's okay, I will say, and she will nod and vanish. It's all right, I will say, and my cat will cease mewing beneath the earth. I put the poems in this book in alphabetical order by title. Uh, one of the things I thought, well, it'd be easy to find them. I hadn't bargained on having to know the alphabet <laughs> to do that. I should have put them in by size. <laughs> this is called Scherzo. The tree meditates as it burns. You are singing, you just don't know it yet. Who is the angel with his foot on the dragon's neck? Who is the dragon? We are all moved by the polarities of grass. Kafka tries to wish us well. Tolstoy tries to wish us well. But they have no idea the empire we're dealing with. Its spillovers clot, its geysers rot into a million Bibles, its ash is ash. Who wouldn't rather start over? The tree meditates as it burns. Myriad the disconnection holding world together. Myriad my love for you shatters. Hang around long enough, you'll be a prop in the next Iliad. I don't think this is going to get any less weird. Dark things following to the car. Dark things saying our nightmares are sissy shit compared to the real. The effort to make something lasting and free progresses no further than a pine needle bed for a wounded animal. Little red gods make the mind a hive, not of bees or wasps, honey or wax, but of fire forged. Blue black glitter shook out. I spend half the afternoon teaching the old wiry dog my name, least I go unrecognized in paradise. Scribblers everywhere. Least the world go blank. Fury of the inward mind. 
moment the teacher turns to the blackboard from the feral faces. What can't be said in person and what can't be said at all. First sentence wrong, first word off. The umbral blot out and spectral eraser. Doesn't everyone have a great uncle who died in the bin, whose papers are still in the attic, a sort of transcendentalist? And a nephew buzzed on Lorca, dive-bombed by Ginsburg, who will never be employed. That's, there's not much difference between writing a novel and drumming your fingers, but try drumming your fingers for six hours a day for five years. Poetry can be brief as shooting yourself in the head. Spring rain, bang. Shall I compare the gray matter on the page? It's easy, just stare at a blank page until a unicorn explodes from your brow, until Rachmaninoff, until Parthenogenesis. Remember spending all Thursday in your PJs getting up only to walk the dog who voluminously sniffs the epic of lawn and pole, adding a few pea cantos of her own. There are two kinds of writing, that which has a clear thesis like too much, sar har too much, like too much sun can harm one, and that which makes any thesis a joke, a rock skipping over a sea-monstered block a spark lurching roof to roof. Let us not on our mortal coil, in our burning bean field, our countdown, forget to praise. Praise the erupting anthill, the spray painted overpass, the inventor of eggnog if we can find her. Praise what we can't find, praise spring rain, praise bang, Apollo, patron of healers, who is also mouse god of plagues. The world proceeds with no design. Design is its paw print in the snow, its blast site, night light, lost watch, arranged bones. Design is the world's prosody, wreckage and dragonfly, bloom and boom, its croon. I love you, I'm not sure this helps, but it's written in crocus, the flaming halo above the birdhouse, monkeys with droids, donkeys with paintbrushes, breeze over wheat, excessive vow open, gluttered, guttle, open and glottal stopped, alighted, howled, crumbled drafts under tinder, your lightning's finger in the leap and fidget of my nerves. <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing? I'm exhausted. <laughs> it's called Selected and Recent Errors. My books are full of mistakes. Not the ones Tony's always pointing out, as if correct spelling is what could stop the conveyor belt the new kid caught his arm in. Three weeks on the job, and he's already 600 legal pages, lawyers haggling in an office with an ignored view of the river, pretending to be asleep, pretending to have insight into its bloody self. You think that's a fucked up, drawn out metaphor? Try this. If you feel like you're writhing like a worm in a bottle of tequila, you don't know it's the quickness of its death that reveals the quality of the product. It's proof. I don't know what I'm talking about either. Do you think the dictionary ever says to itself, I've got these words that mean completely different things inside myself and it's tearing me apart? My errors are even bigger than that. You start taking down the walls of your house, sooner or later it'll collapse, but not before you can walk around with your eyes closed rolled backwards and staring straight into the manigulous, amigulous meat locker of your own damn self hanging there.
do that for a while, and it's easier to light to delight in snow that lasts only 20 minutes longer than a life held together by the twisted silver bailing wire of deception and stealth. But I ain't confessing nothing. On mornings when I hope you forget my name, I walk through the high wet weeds that don't have names either. I do not remember the word do. I do not remember what I told you with your ear in my teeth. Further and further into the woods. We have absolutely no proof God isn't an insect rubbing her hind legs together to sing or boring into us like a yellow jacket into a fallen overripe pear or an assassin bug squatting over us shoving a proboscis right through our breastplate, then sipping. How wonderful our poisons don't kill her. Because of where, where we are, I, I was looking, looking for a poem that had some sort of unobscene reference to uh, to the history of our country. Uh, and this is the only, this is sort of the best I could come up with. It's called Sex with Strangers. I was having sex with a stranger when I realized this was no stranger, this was Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> wife of the 32nd president of the United States. Of course I was shocked, but it seemed rude to stop having sex so I went on having sex. Her hair was getting rather deranged, and she was concentrating hard like a person trying to move a paper clip by the force of mind alone, which brought out the equine qualities of her facial structure, not in a bad way. <laughs> One reason to have sex is to help a stranger get in touch with his or her animal being, even if it's a crayfish. In the kitchen, the rotisserie was laboring. Either the chicken was too fat or it was tuckering out. Oddly, I didn't feel bad for Franklin Delano, even though he looked jaunty and vulnerable in his wheelchair in the margin of the dictionary. In general, it's difficult to feel bad about anything while having sex, which is why it's such a, proper, a popular activity, and even the church is against it except in rare, primarily utilitarian instances. That pretty much covers the facts of my life. I've never been in much of a car crash. When I walk into the mirror of the high grass under the tired suicide note of the setting sun, I'm never gone long. Once I was stuck in an elevator, all of us strangers gasping at once, but there the resemblance to having sex ended because it only took 35 seconds to get going again. Each of us off at a different floor. Cardiology, oncology, psychiatry, the burn unit, the solarium. Thank you, I find those polite intervals of Applause, very encouraging. <laughs> Delphiniums in a window box. Every sunrise, sometimes strangers' eyes. Not necessarily swans, even crows, even the evening fuselage of bats. That place where the creek goes underground, how many weeks before I see you again? Stacks of books, every page, characters rage, and poets strange contraption of syntax and song. Every song, even when there isn't one. Every thistle, splinter, butterfly over the drainage ditches. Every stray. Did you see that meteor shower? Every question. Conversation, even with almost nothing. Cricket, cloud. Because of you, I'm talking to crickets. Clouds, confiding in a cat. Everyone says, come to your senses. And I do, of you. 
every touch electric, every taste of you, every smell, even burning sugar, every cry and laugh. Toothpicked samples at the farmer's market, every melon, plum, I come undone, undone. I've got my uh, med list with me in case anybody would like to hear me read that. Uh, just a couple more and then people can say things. Um, I, I teach. Uh, my friend Tony Hoagland once said, you know, we spend a lifetime deranging our senses, uh, quoting Rambeau, and then he says, and all that society can do is, is put us in front of young, impressionable minds. Um, but one of the things teaching does is it, it, is, it allows you and encourages you to pay close attention to, to your subject. Um, for me, that's poetry and writing poetry. And, and one of the things that I'm aware about these kind of shapes that poets, poems uh, inhabit is the, the then I realized shape. Uh, you know, uh, I walked outside, it rained, I hurt my toe on a, on a rock, then I realized that life is fe fleeting, but still I'm made of comets or something like that. And that shape, that shape of realization in, in Western literature is... Uh, I'm not patient at all. Um, in, in, in Western poetry is, is we inherit from the Romantics. Um, and so I wrote this poem called Romanticism 101, and I thought I'd just distill it to those moments of, of uh, uh, realization without any context for the realization. Romanticism 101. Then I realized I hadn't secured the boat. Then I realized my friend had lied to me. Then I realized my dog was gone no matter how much I called in the rain. All was change. Then I realized I was surrounded by aliens disguised as orthodontists, having a convention at the hotel breakfast bar. Then I could see into the life of things, that systems seek only to reproduce the conditions of their own reproduction. If I had to pick between shadows and essences, I'd pick shadows. They're better dancers. They always sing their telegrams. Their old gods do not die. Then I realized the very futility was salvation in this greeny entanglement of breaths. Yeah, as if. Then I realized that was her in the red convertible. They were speaking French, and all I understood were the words for sun and egg. Even when you catch the mechanism, the trick still convinces. Then I came to in Texas and realized rockabilly would never go away. Then I realized I'd been drugged. We were all chasing nothing which left no choice but to intensify the chase. I came to handcuffed and gagged. I came to intubated and packed in some kind of foam. This too is how ash moves through water. All this time, the side doors unlocked. Then I realized repetition could be an ending. Then I realized repetition could be an ending. So I'll stop after, after this poem and, and something else will happen. Um, a little, a little context for this poem, even though I don't really much think that we need context for poems. The primary context for poetry, for any one poem, is is poetry. It's not 
not the world, it's poetry. It's words on the page and all those other words that, that have ever been put on pages. I know that's something of a grand and quixotic notion, but it's mine. Um, so um, a little over a couple years ago, I had a somewhat extreme medical procedure. Uh, so that, that comes into play at the end of the poem. And also this poem uh, uh, mentions Alexander Videnski, uh, a little known Russian absurdist poet who's actually uh, some recent translations of his work are now available, and I, I, I recommend it to you. He was one of those revelations to me. You know, when I find a poet who corroborates this sense of, of whatever is this sense of not fitting and, and, and this profound notion that, that this, isn't, this isn't all of it, uh, it's always, a, it's always a great wonderment to me and a great sustenance, so it was, it was wonderful to find his work. The poem's called Believe in Magic, question mark. And that really is, a, is it a monkey song? Do you believe in magic? Herman's Hermits? Yeah. Love and Spoonful, yeah. John Sebastian, who was almost a member of Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but he didn't want to join. Believe in magic? How could I not? Have seen a man walk up to a piano and both survive. Have turned the exterminator away. Seen lipstick on a wine glass not shatter the wine. Seen rainbows in puddles. Been recognized by stray dogs. I believe reality is approximately 65% if. All rivers are full of sky. Waterfalls have mines. We come from slime, even alpacas. I believed we're surrounded by crystals, not just Alexander Videnski. Maybe dysentery, maybe a guard's bullet did him in. Nonetheless, nevertheless, I believe that there are many kingdoms left. The Declaration of Independence was written with a feather a single gem has throbbed in my chest my whole life, even though, even though this is my second heart. Because the first failed, was given that opportunity, was cut out in pieces and incinerated, I asked, and so was denied the chance to regard my own heart in a jar. Strange tangled imp, we slick it in red brambles. You know what it feels like to hold a burning piece of paper, maybe even trying to read it as the flames get close to your fingers until all you're holding is a curl of ash by its white tip, by its white ear tip, yet the words still hover in the air. That's how I feel now all the time. Thank you. So this is the, uh, the other part of this event, which apparently you are supposed to say things and I say things that have very little to do with what, <laughs> what you say. I've already prepared my answers, so you can ask me anything. Hi. Hi, I, I love your poetry. Thank you so much for. What's the matter with you? I, sorry, I'm sorry. Actually, Thank my you. my remark or question sort of addresses what's the matter with me for loving your poetry. Uh, no, you know, I, I, even though I know that this isn't the proper definition of the phrase negative capability, I often think of negative capability when I read your poems because out of uh, it's my own definition of negative capability out of sort of the ash comes the, the, the phoenix often in your poems. And I'm just wondering if you are um, consciously aware of almost 
I shouldn't say almost always, but a lot of times starting with the negative and then coming into the positive in the poems because it's, it sort of seems to me that the destruction precedes the creation in your poetry most of the time. Yeah, I think that's true. And well, sometimes I actually try to reverse it uh, because everything, it's, it's flux. That's, that's what's most important to me. Uh, that's, that's what the nature of my experience and, and what I think and, and how I think and feel is. Negative capability, a little pedantic moment on my part for all of you, is, is, a, is a, uh, a term coined by John Keats in a letter to his brother George, which he defined uh, being in, in the presence of doubts, mysteries, uncertainties, maybe a couple other things, without any irritable reaching after fact. Uh, he wrote that letter after a night of, of being made to, to feel like a, an idiot at a dinner party, basically, because he was, he was surrounded by, by eggheads. Uh, so he sort of felt like he had to stick up for a kind of different kind of knowing. The curious thing about that uh, uh, letter is that we, we don't have the, the original, anime. I know this is way, I just love this story though. We don't have the uh, original letter uh, the letter was sent to George when he was in America. When he died, his wife, who was in possession of the letter, remarried, and her husband, who was barely literate, copied these letters again because they thought they would sell them and make some money, because Keats was already Keats by then, dead and, and Keats. And uh, he, w he made a number of mistakes, which have become obvious as the years have gone by. Uh, Keats is, was, was a terrible speller, uh, his handwriting wasn't good, and he would write cross letters. So he'd write this way and then turn the paper uh, uh, 90 degrees and then write that way too. So his letters were difficult to, to uh, uh, decipher. So what the bottom line is, is it's possible that this phrase, negative capability, actually, which is about being able to entertain uncertainties, uh, Keats called it something else. And, and this was what this guy deciphered as, as him. But yeah, I, I, did I answer your question at all? It's, it's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, spent a life in education, a lot, of, a lot of teaching. Would you talk a little bit about teaching how to, to do poetry? It's a big question, but that's what you do for a living, and yeah. it would be nice to hear about that. Yeah. Uh, it's something, I hate to use the word serious, but I can't think of another word for it. But I, I am very serious, and, and I, I, another word which always makes me kind of giggle to use, but I do have a pedagogy of teaching creative writing. I basically believe uh, that it's very important for a poet to not know what she is doing that the best things that we accomplish are when we don't know what we're doing. So the question is then, how do you get better at not knowing what you're doing? So the first thing I do in, in a workshop is, is make sure that, I teach graduate students, so these are advanced students, uh, that, that it's not evaluative. Because that just leads one way, you know, uh, everybody says, you know, this poem is pretty good, but it'd be better if I wrote it. Who, who cares? You know, it's your poem. You're trying to write it, and you know we're, we're interested in the decisions you're making, and maybe the, some of the decisions you're not realizing you're making. But so what we can do is is take these products which are done by not knowing what you're doing, and talk about them consciously, so that the author of the poem is is made aware of how the poem is working and what it's doing, the literary devices of it. And then that becomes conscious. And you say, oh, OK, I know how to do that. But if you're an artist, and in general, the conscious mind, whatever we want to call that, I, uh, its its other part, which I call the imagination, is always going to say, oh, you think you know how this, how this works. Watch this. 
So we start out, we have a product of the imagination. Other people come in and say, oh, here, here's what this is doing. You know, you're, you're using, uh, uh, there's, there's the ghost of a metric in this poem, and, and notice how, how it's structured. And then you say, oh, I'm conscious of that. So for a little while, the imagination and the consciousness are, 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 are on even levels. And then the imagination says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Watch this. So the level of not knowing what you're doing gets more sophisticated. So for me, uh, I, I try to create a, a climate which is not about judgment. It's about description of what, what's being brought in and what, what we're looking at. And, and you know, talking about poems in terms of other poems, in terms of other, you know, the history of poetry. So, you know, with my students, a lot of my students are, um, they're well-read, but they're well-read only three years back. Uh, so I, I also, you know, I'm the, I'm the 250-year-old guy in the room, and, and I'm always... I'm always pulling that out and, you know, reminding them that, you know, poetry has been around, like, before this century. Um, so that's part of, you know, I, I, have a, I have an archival role to do. Does that make any sense? Is that... Hi. Hi, how you doing? So uh, I have to ask. Are you excited about anything new that you're not knowing how to do? Uh, yeah, whatever, whatever the next poem's going to be. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I always feel like I'm starting over. Uh, and that I believe in first-mindedness, that when I sit down and, 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 write, which I do nearly every day, I have no idea what a poem is. I can recognize one, but I have no idea how to make one. So that, that's both a, a, a cheering notion, because it means I haven't lost anything, because I never had anything to lose. But it's also, it's also kind, of, kind of terrifying. But, Terror and excitement, you know, they're, they're twins. So that's, you know, I, hopefully my next poem will be, will exist. And that seems exciting to me. Thank you. Terror and excitement. I got it. <laughs> Can we <you> sit? <laughs> um, what advice do you have for poets who like to write? or inspiration? Uh, keep writing and never lose contact with that initial impulse of why you ever wrote a poem. That's your connection. That's, that's your connection to the art and it's profound and it's true and no one can ever take it away from you. It's what makes you eternal. Always remember that. You know, the, the longer, the longer you, you do it, the more it becomes, you know, a business, like, like things like this. And, and things like this don't matter. They really don't. What matters is when you sit down by yourself and you write. And that's when you are exercising your, pure, your liberty of mind and spirit, but also your profound connection to this art. This art Poetry, which has been around as long, longer than any other language art we have. Poetry has been with us since, since we had language. The first, the first word was probably yikes. And, you know, in, in Western civilization, our, 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 the earliest written documents we have are, are, are lists. Donkeys, two bales of hay, a cow. You know, maybe they're bills of sale. No, they're poems. So that's what you're connected to. That's yours and, and, and never lose it. And the only way you can keep it alive perpetually is just write. Write without expectation as, as an exercise of your liberty. Breton talks about blackening some pages with a praiseworthy disdain of literature. 
don't forget your disdain of literature. That's a good thing to keep you going, too. As the 250-year-old man in the room, um, what is there a particular stream of poetry that you feel that, that you and Tony and, say, Billy Collins um, represent in terms of bringing humor to the, to the forefront of the um, emotional response of the poem? Uh, I would say that, that I, regardless of, of my regard for the two poets you've mentioned, Tony Hoagland and Billy Collins, I would say that, that our, our, the sort of constellations of poetry that we, we wind up are, you know, our, our canons are extremely different. Uh, you know, I, I, my my tradition comes from uh, 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 the Romantics through through Surrealism, and Surrealism is 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 at the core of what I what I believe art is for to hasten the coming debacle of our consciousness, the the debacle we've all been promised. Uh, humor humor just seems inadvertent to me. Uh, once I was asked at a, at a reading like this why my poems are, are funny, and I said, because life is brief, we often don't get what we want, and then we die. And the audience burst out laughing. So, you know, things are funny because there's a joke, but also sometimes things are funny because we, we get the truth in a context in which we were not prepared for the truth. And that's, that's one of the reasons why kids are so funny because they say the truth and at moments when we have no intention of acknowledging that truth, that we don't have the context for that truth. So I think that's where kind of my, my, my humor comes from. It's more, more a violation. Uh, Tony, Tony, I think, is, is funny because, uh, well, it's too complicated, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.